Uh, if you wish to discuss issues with the members of the school board, and um, we already have 18 people who have signed up, so uh, we're, the listening sessions are designed to create a more informal setting for residents to engage in conversations with district leaders about issues or concerns. Representatives from the school board, along with the superintendent and other district leaders, will be available during the session to discuss issues with you. A summary of topics discussed during the listening session will be shared with the full board and the viewing audience at each school board meeting. Depending on the number of forms submitted, the facilitator may need to limit the, may need to set time limits, and tonight we've set four minutes for each speaker. If many persons wish to speak on the same topic, the board members present may ask that a spokesperson be designated to allow more time for discussion. While comments and questions on issues are welcome, the law prohibits the board from discussing concerns about individual employees or students in public meetings. Please forward comments regarding individuals to the superintendent. If additional conversation follow-up is necessary, the superintendent will direct staff members to contact you. We're gonna use the same process that we used at the public hearings. Carissa will call three names. One will be the speaker, one person will be on deck, and one will be in the hole, so to speak, to come up. Um, again, it's four minutes. Barb will time that. We're gonna strictly adhere to that because we do have 18 speakers and we have to get through this before. Um, before 6.30, the start of our board. In addition to the, to the four minutes, then there'll be a one minute time for administration or the, uh, the board to ask further questions or follow up. So with that, we'll get started. Our first speaker is Fred Anderson, followed by Chad Nelson and Lance Cunningham. If you'd make your way up to the front so we can move through, that would be great. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Fred. All right. Kathy Tom, uh, admin. All right, so uh, I'll try to be brief. I don't have much of a choice. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about computer education in our schools. And um, I think that we have uh, a really good opportunity going forward here in some spaces that aren't being filled. And I just want to talk about a couple of points. Uh, full disclosure, um, I don't really I don't mean any disrespect to any of the current programs that we have or any of the people teaching. I've met a lot of our computer teachers. I'm pretty much just basing my thoughts on my opinions, my observations. I've talked with uh, Principal Bach, uh, Van Scoy, um, Field. Um, I've, I volunteer at the Virtual Synergy class, which is our junior high school computer programming club. Uh, I volunteered at our elementary school to do our hours of code. So that's kind of where I'm coming with some of this information. So, uh, so talk a little bit about the, the current state of programming in our schools and uh, programming coding. We'll just call it coding. A lot of people call it that. It's kind of a general term. Uh, there's three classes in the high school. Uh, one of them is an AP class, which is Java, which is essentially, I mean, it's a high-end class. It's, a, it's kind of a, a structured language, and it's meant to just move one semester forward in college. It's not really meant to give somebody a great computer programming uh, experience. Uh, the other two classes are some prepackaged classes for app programming and game programming. They're each one semester. I think they're doing, from what Mr. Bach said, they're doing really well. They've been growing every year. Uh, the problem is it's one semester. Um, the description for the course is that you need absolutely no experience going in, so you can imagine after 80, 90 hours where you'll be, and that's sort of the end. And then I guess you go from there, you know, you could go right up to AP, which is a pretty big leap, right? So you're not, it's not connecting. And I guess what I'm talking about is we see a lot of STEM and STEAM throughout our district all the time. You guys hear about it up here. Um, but it's a lot of loose ends. You know, there's a lot of things that when we're going through our bridge to excellence, we see something that's happening. Go, oh, we can hang a flag on that and say that's part of STEM or that's part of STEAM, but it's not connected at least not from my observations. Again, I'm not trying to, uh, there's, I'm sure there's 90% of what's happening out there is going right past me, so it's, it's just my observation. Um, where I'm coming from, uh, and so I guess another thing I want to state, uh, the last time I talked to you in December, beginning of December, I talked to Kathy and Mike was up here, uh, I handed out uh, or sent you an email with a, a pretty good research paper that shows there's a great disparity between what 
the, what the administrators and the, the boards of this country think people need for computer programming and what parents and students think is happening in schools or what should be happening in schools. And it's a, it's a very big, is that one left? Okay, I'll be quick. Um, I guess what I want to talk about real quick then is, is we need to find opportunities as we, my ask here would be that we find opportunities uh, where we start to see these things. I'm not really asking you to do anything other than to notice these things as they're coming up coding and try to put those loose ends together. Real quick, some of my experience is in my job, what I do is I mentor uh, interns partially as you know, one side part of my job in computer programming. And I'm noticing more and more that people are coming from these code schools. I'm not getting as many people from, from college and AP classes coming in. I'm getting people that go to these boot camps. They get you know, 1,200 hours in three months or whatever, and then they come in. And it's actually working really well. And one of my concerns is that as that's our, I see people now at high, at, right out of high school going to that and coming in. So I can see that pushing down. Previously, those code schools were sort of a place that was set up for people that didn't do well in college or chose that they wanted to do something else. All right, Sorry, that's Brad. that. Any questions Thanks, about computer programming? Anything? I guess, I guess the one comment that I would like to make is, um, to me, what you're talking about is curriculum and having sound, consistent systems in place for students. And I think that's one of the reasons that we hired Denise, um, Superintendent Pontrelli, uh, because she has that curriculum and teaching strength and I think that's, th those are the kinds of things that I think we want to improve on in our district. So I'll turn it over to you, but that's my guess. Yep, Fred, I appreciate you bringing that up because I know um, just your experience in the schools. I know my son has, has experienced you um, working with them in the classrooms. And these are, your last uh, time you were up in front of the board speaking to this has um, caused us to have more conversations at all the secondary levels and how do we, f how do we really fill those gaps? Uh, particularly now that it's a it's a national push as well, uh, coming down from um, from suggested um, uh, legislation in terms of what should we be doing uh, specific to coding and, and the importance of it. So I appreciate you making that um, that statement here because I think it's in line with where we want to go. It's where the secondary principals for sure want to go, as well as uh, John Perry, our our director of technology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll send an email to you a little bit more of the details that we didn't get to, and then you can ask any other questions. Thank Thanks, you. Fred. Thanks. Chad Nelson, Lance Cunningham, and Sarah Steveland. Thank you. Could we have a few extra for other board members? Okay. Perfect. Well, good evening. Good evening. Um, so if I could turn your attention to this side um, for a minute. So trying to pare this down in just a couple minutes worth of conversation. I think everything we do in life, especially in the educational system, it has to tie back to that advancing the mission, right? That's why we exist, and that usually becomes kind of our fabric of which we want to make decisions. And when I read through some of the things that I saw on the Stillwater website, and I think, Kathy, you talked about those seven key categories, right? And I listed them on the left-hand side. But one of the things I saw out of that as I went through it is I worked, I've seen the word community, and the word community tended to resonate with me because as a community member and a taxpayer, this is, I think, why a bulk of the, the, the individuals are here tonight. Um, but what I wanted to talk about then was every, every community has some key elements, and those elements make up what communities are and what makes them special or unique. And so when we go through this, schools are probably the first and one of the first and most important things. Churches, local businesses, um, they, really are, they really need a vibrant educational or institution or school system in their communities to survive or thrive. Parents tend to make up a lot of that through volunteers, volunteering for the local schools. I know Withrow particularly, I have interest in. Um, the parents really make that place special. But on the bottom is taxpayers. So if I took myself out of the parenting role for a little bit, um, there's going to be some significant impacts to the Washington County tax base, let alone not only the taxes that we, we're going to have to be reassessed against, because when you take those schools away, that's why people move to the community. And not only will the taxes go down, but they're going to go down as a reflection of lower property values. And so what realtors tend to do is not buy or build or sell homes. What they do is they create neighborhoods. And I think we really need to take that into consideration. The last thing I'll leave you with is, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't need to know, 
but I think there's been a lack of transparency around options. So I know I, in just some recent conversations or listening on some of the chatter on YouTube or wherever you guys, um, wherever the communication is, what can we do around options? As a businessman, I don't care if it's a $50 expenditure or a $5 million expenditure. <coughs> Usually there's, here's what I want, here's where we're at today, and then I come armed with a bunch of information that helps me tell my story or a compelling story why I choose option A. And I just feel that I personally haven't been able to see that, and I hope that information resides and you would be able to share that with the community. Thanks, Jed. Could you give us your address, too? Uh, 12768, 170th Street North, Marine, Minnesota. Great. Any questions or comments? I'd just like to share with you, Chad, um, I appreciate the information that you brought together here. And I think that's one of the things that we've heard from the community is we need to do a better job sharing about all the options we did look at. Um, one of the things that we had intended was to move forward with the school board with several, several options. But when we looked through a number of lenses, first, how do we address capacity, better programming for kids, and then uh, cost? it really started to limit our options. And so I agree with you. We thought that we would come forward with more. The other thing that we need to do, I think, is share uh, from the community those options that have come forward, that they were considered, and where they fit and where they don't, so that people understand that those were considered. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, and I think just to echo on that, thank you. Is, and it really goes back to that, how do we answer that, that question around advancing our mission? And we really have to make sure that it's not a financial thing. It's not a, a mom thing or a dad thing. It's, it's what are we doing to better the community around our mission? And as long as that's taken into consideration, we can answer those questions honestly. I, th I think whatever the decision is, it w is what it is, and we would support it. Thank you very much. I guess I, I would just like to comment on your option A, and I think I've mentioned this previously, is the last time we did boundaries, we did try to expand the boundaries for both Marine and Withrow to get more kids up there okay. but families chose not to they did not want that and so that's one thing that we did try um, the other thing that we have going on in our district which is very important to our families is alternate enrollment and families making choices to uh, bring their students to the schools that they think is the best fit and um, so while we can make a bigger boundary ultimately our families have choice. And okay. so that's kind of one of the reasons that we're in this situation. Um, it's a good bad thing of alternate. It family, is, right? it's, it's, it's something that's very important to families and, um, but there's an impact of that. So it's, it's complex. So this was just a draft I did yep. send you, I, did, I think I sent some a PowerPoint slide with some more information yep. and so definitely. And we'll share this with the rest of the board. Okay, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Lance Cunningham, Sarah Steveland, and Clayton Heimke. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, first, I just want to say I support Fred's uh, suggestion about improving computer science curriculum in the district. I, as a technologist myself, think that's important. And even uh, looking at starting uh, computer science awareness and knowledge in the elementary schools even uh, is important. Can I get um, your address, Lance? Oh, sorry. Uh, 9171 130th Street North, Hugo, Minnesota. Thanks. So I want to address why the community came out against the um, uh, proposal to delay the vote tonight. I understand why there's confusion, uh, you know, because we had been asking for significant delays in this process. And so I want to really focus on why we see this delay as a, as a problem. So I have a number of key points on that. One, we have been asking for an indefinite delay since this whole process started. We knew right away that less than 60 days was an unacceptable timeline. However, our requests were continually dismissed by both the administration as well as members of the board. Two, our request for the delay was for the community to get engaged on exploring alternatives. However, in the administration's request, there is no mention of doing so. They've only asked for more time to continue to spread their message and try and turn the tide of continuously growing opposition to the bold proposal. Later, number three, later tonight you will hear from Bill Wright and I believe some others about what we have in mind for community engagement, including a number of community task force groups. Uh, and three weeks is simply not enough time for those to get organized and create meaningful input uh, and output from those groups. Uh, number four, a majority of municipalities within District 834 as well as other government officials have passed resolutions asking you to slow this process down. However, I don't think three weeks is what they had in mind. Uh, it's just not enough time to create meaningful change and adopt meaningful input. 
Number five, the district was served with a notice of claim from the community on Tuesday afternoon. The district released the request for delay first thing Wednesday morning. While the administration has claimed the request for delay has nothing to do with a potential lawsuit, I question that. The bold proposal is now facing a true legal challenge, and the district administration would be forced to provide significant documentation regarding findings of fact to support their defense. If this process was followed the way it should, a written document and presentation outlining those findings of fact uh, would be ready tonight that justifies the bold proposal in closing of the three elementary schools. If the administration did not have their findings of fact already documented, this certainly would create a heavy burden on the district to justify this action in the event of such legal questioning. Therefore, we have to assume that the administration is simply asking for more time to prepare the findings of fact that should be already done. So I have to ask, is the administration prepared? If so, I would like to see this presented tonight regardless of the final vote is delayed or not. If not, I would expect a formal request of this documentation in the morning so that we know where the administration is at today. And if there is uh, no documentation available, this request for a delay is a, is a well-disguised farce. Our community is weary from fighting for what we believe in, and it is clear to us that after weeks of this, and at the two little too late Q&A sessions with Withwell and Marine this week, that there doesn't seem to be an interest in listening, much less acknowledging our perspectives. The last minute request by the administration seems to be self-serving, and this Request the administration requested this aggressive timeline and they along with members of the board have long refused our request to change it Please hold the administration and yourselves accountable for that The only positive path that will truly allow for community re-engagement and to reverse the downward spiral and the wake of collateral damage The bold proposal has created since day one is to put a stop to it tonight I implore the board to reject the delay and vote no on the bold proposal a unanimous no vote tonight that supports the overwhelming and growing voice of the community an instruction to the administration to start over and work with the community, take the time that it'll take, and create community task force that you'll hear more about and develop a new plan to solve the challenges District 834 faces. Thanks for sharing your perspective. <laughs> Questions, comments? I think you're going to hear why tonight when they ask for their recommendation to delay this. So okay. I think that's probably where we'll all hear it. So but I appreciate you sharing your perspective on this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sarah Stivland, Clayton Heimke, and D.D. Armstrong. My name is Sarah Stivland. I live at 11080 Penfield Avenue North in Stillwater Township. So, Stillwater School District does not have a declining population. We have a declining capture rate. Our current capture rate is 72%. This shows a lack of confidence in our schools. The state average is 80%. We should raise our capture rate, which has dropped by 10% over the past 10 years. Our elementary age population has only dropped by 1% during that time. We can do better. Population is expected to grow over the next 15 years, according to the Washington County website. We have a largely <coughs> rural school district, which means there is open land which is ripe for development. With the completion of the new bridge, growth will certainly be encouraged. We must plan for this growth now. I want to take a moment to review the guiding change document that drives the bold, bold proposal. In the first column, titled Current Reality, we find a long list of challenges that relate to a decade of shrinking budgets, declining enrollment, and inconsistent leadership. This includes things such as staff turnover, lack of funds for technology, lack of planning for the middle school model, and declining achievement, all district-wide issues. In order to consider closing a school, the items on this list should reflect the specific reason for that, something such as failing population, no community support, 
maintenance or repair issues that cannot be overcome. None of that sort of thing is here. What is mentioned here is a balanced budget, passage of a levy and bond referendums, and the bridge to excellence, all examples of huge community support. The next column is desired result. Things like students will demonstrate growth, creative programs will be developed, normal technology access will be provided, and feedback from stakeholders will be gathered are things that have little to do with the individual schools being threatened right now. I would argue that by closing the three schools, these items might not be addressed because of having to deal with all of the drastic changes that BOLD will cause. These desired results are important goals and we support the leadership of this district in making progress on all of them. The third column is unacceptable means. It states that, quote, we will not violate state laws or negotiated agreements. Many people here tonight believe that you have already done just that on both accounts. It appears that the idea of closing schools has been secretly discussed for quite some time. And we all know that we were promised that no schools would be closed if the levy and the bond passed. It goes on to say that decisions will not be made outside of district vision or BTE priorities, the bridge to excellence. Here are just a few of the beliefs listed in our strategic plan. We believe that all people have inherent value, that our future is dependent on outstanding leadership, that all people deserve the environment and opportunity to discover and maximize their potential, and that relationships based on caring, honesty, and respect strengthen our community. I invite you to consider whether Bold the Plan itself is already outside of this vision. It states, we will not continue to spend more money to provide an equitable education for all students. This problem is not that you're, not, that you're spending too much in some areas, but the district has not sufficiently addressed the challenges some of our schools are facing. This goes back to declining enrollment and poor leadership. Closing schools will make these problems worse. Here's how I see it. If you wait for three more weeks, you drag this painful process out longer. If you vote yes, you would be violating your own standards for unacceptable means and possibly breaking the law. If you vote no tonight, you acknowledge that these three schools have value in the district and to our community. You say that all of these students and their families have a voice and they matter. A vote no tonight means you have listened and have heard the concerns which are numerous and compelling. A vote no tonight means you are dedicated to inspiring excellence for all of our students. Thank you. Sarah, the um, guiding change that you are um, uh, referring to is uh, created with uh, administrators, the board, community, and some of the things that you shared about current reality, yes, those are things that are, were created through public engagement with teachers, parents, community. Um, the purpose of a document like this isn't to have every detail, so you're correct that it doesn't. And also it does um, focus on the entire district. And I guess I just have to say that obviously we disagree about violating state laws or negotiated agreement. But that being said, um, the things that you mentioned, declining enrollment capture rate, are all of those things that we're looking at and I just want to remind everyone that the reason we need to look at this is for the entire district, um, not just a few of our schools. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Clayton Heimke, Dee Dee Armstrong, and Brandon Auger. Hi, Clayton. Whoa, Careful. it's on wheels. Come on. <laughs> slide right it's off. on wheels. I'll be off the edge. Yeah. Um, I'm Clayton Hemke. Uh, address is 14044 107th Street North. Hopefully at some point I can be here as much as Fred where I don't even have to give my address. So, um, what city, please? Oh, sorry, Stillwater Township. Okay, thank you. So, uh, board administration, thank you again for your time. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not overly prepared. I sat at a coffee shop for about 20 minutes today. Work got in the way. So, um, you've heard my concerns in the past um, in, in public hearings about loss and about the fear of that in it. It's truly a fear, um, a fear for the district, a fear for the community, a fear for the families, um, and, and it continues to be. I have referenced a uh, survey in the past um, that, that was put out um, that has been 
told to me that it is um, not a viable survey because it was, it, it's an emotional response. And while I would agree that on some level it's an emotional response, parents are very aware of the decisions they make. Um, from this survey, there were, I believe, what was it, 385 responses. In those responses, um, and, and I'll send this to you guys. I didn't get time as I was preparing to email it to you, but I've got the survey results summary. I'll send it to the administration as well. I'm, I'm sorry I haven't gotten it to you yet. But no worries, that's great. Uh, no, it's not. It. It's yeah. not acceptable. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so this talks about 603 current and future students that the families say that would no longer enroll in Stillwater schools open, alternate, residing in the district enrollment. I know, as we said, it's just emotional responses. Other districts are full. Other schools are full. We, we've heard that rhetoric. But of those 603 students, 85 of them are from families that don't have kids in one of these three affected schools. This wasn't a, this was a survey that was put out just to most, it was put out on the Stop Bold Cold website, I believe, but it was mostly about, you know, Marine Withrow and Oak Park <laughs> parents taking it. And my concern is if there's 85 students from families that aren't even in these schools that are affected that are leaving, there's value in this survey and there's value in that response. That was from, eight, and there were 82 families that responded um, that were outside of those schools. So out of 82 families, there were 85 total students. And I believe it was, um, I think it was like 27 families. So, you know, I had two and a half kids a family or something like that, or three point something. Um, but again, I'll send it to you. One thing I've been amazed by is uh, recent discussions around homeschooling, even if these schools are full and uh, you know, there's a there, there's already a strong. Oh my gosh, are sorry. you kidding? You're not that sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so let me talk faster. So um, let's skip a little bit about these 518 kids, pre-K, zero to pre-K, elementary and high school from the families that actually reside or open enroll or alternate enroll into those schools. Why is that number so high? My family moved from Wisconsin to St. Paul to District 833 to Oak Park Heights to Stillwater Township between July 2011 and February 14, 2014 just to find the proper environment for our kids. Four moves in three years is crazy, but it was incredibly worth it. My drive to Bloomington for work each day is great because I know my kids are in the right place for them. One thing I've learned, though, even though we move so much, since moving to Withrow is that I've met so many families that have made similar moves. They're looking for the right environment. These schools aren't, I know, they aren't a program. They, they, they aren't a, an official program, but they are programming that people are seeking out and moving here for. And by, by closing them, we're losing that. We're losing what we can be modeling, what we can be understanding. And it, it, it's not about doing what those schools do. It's about finding what the other elementary schools do well and marketing that in the same way that my family and so many other families have sought out these three schools. So where do we go? Let's get back to partnering with the community. I feel like there's a divide between us and I don't want that. We need to be able to sit down and discuss. I feel like when we're talking, you're taking notes, but we're not having a conversation. It's a one-way street, just like this. And that, that's not right. That's not how we get community engagement it's not how we get to a resolution that the community can buy into. I hate to cut you off. I know, I'm sorry, Tom. Your other speaker, but thank you for sharing. Dee Dee, Dee Dee Armstrong, Brandon Oje, and Nance Purcell. That's true. Thank you. 
to my other board members. Sorry for. I got some more for you. Don't worry. Golly, it's been a stressful 57 days, hasn't it? Oh, I gotta get your address too. I'm getting there. Okay, oh. it's part of the plan. I'm Dee Dee Armstrong. There we go. I live at 3085 St. Croix Trail in Afton. I have three kids in the district, one at the high school, one at Oakland Junior High, and one at Afton Lakeland. First of all, thank you. I don't think it's been an extremely pleasant time for anyone these past 57 days. You've had a spotlight that's been shined on you and sometimes that's not very fun. So that's why I brought you some Coca-Colas. A little peace offering, a little brightener for your evening because I don't think it's gonna be very fun either. I would like to use my time to tell you three stories which I think might be illustrative of the juncture that we find ourselves at. The first story is that I want you to think about is Comcast. Nobody likes them. Everybody hates their customer service. <laughs> but for cable, that's what you've got for a choice. But their service is horrible. People don't trust them. They just make people cringe. They have a monopoly on the cable market around here. That is, until people got fed up with the status quo of ickiness. Then, things like Hulu and Amazon Fire Stick and Apple TV and so many other options started happening and Comcast lost market share as people ditched their cable for non-traditional options. What I'm getting at with this illustration is, if you wanna keep and attract your customers, do not assume that your monopoly on the market will do the trick. You've gotta give excellent service. You've gotta to be top notch at giving the best service with friendly faces no matter what your monopoly you think is. The second case is this, Coca-Cola. In 1985, Coca-Cola was the leading soda seller on the market. But they were seeing erosion in their market share to Pepsi. So their leadership decided that they couldn't keep losing market share and hatched a brilliant plan. They introduced new Coke to capture more market share. They stopped selling the original Coke. However, the elimination of what had made Coke great created a huge negative, even hostile reaction. There was some acceptance of the new formula for some drinkers, however, there were many more who resented the change and were not shy about making that known. And that was even before social media. Groups were formed against the new Coke formula. It was mocked on late night TV. Really bad publicity. Following the new Coke introduction, only 13% of those polled said they preferred new Coke. Pepsi gained 14% in sales increases. So the change actually had folks leaving the long-standing premiere of the soda market. Just three months after the new Coke launch, Coca-Cola's executives and their board of directors announced the return to the original Coke formula. Donald Keough, the CEO, said, the simple fact is that all the time and money and skill poured into consumer research on the new Coca-Cola could not measure or reveal the deep and abiding emotional attachment to original Coca-Cola felt by so many. 30 years later, Coca-Cola still lives with the new Coke lesson, said their spokesperson. 30 years ago, we introduced new Coke with no shortage of hype and fanfare. And it did succeed in shaking up the market, but not in the way it was intended. When we look back, this was the pivotal moment where we learned that fiercely loyal customers, not the company, own Coca-Cola and all our brands. It is a lesson that we take seriously and one that becomes clearer and more obvious with each passing anniversary. The key here is that Coca-Cola realized that their customers, their public, own Coca-Cola. They now offer them a variety of choice but they never forget that it's the customers who are in the driver's seat. The final lesson is from Grand Prairie Inter Independent School District in Texas. I have their information here. They were faced with a budget deficit of $15 million, which was due to compressed state funding and new charter schools within the district's boundaries. They had an elementary school that was looking for at closure due to low enrollment. They had neighborhoods that were graying. They were faced with a dilemma all too familiar to us here in Stillwater. Their superintendent and leadership went around the state of Texas looking at best practices and began to really think outside the box. The result, they got the community and administration and board to work together on an outside the box idea. They all worked together on something that hadn't been done in Texas or anywhere else before. Their results, they increased enrollment by 800 students over the course of three years. 800, can you even imagine? 
They pulled students from across neighboring districts and from private and charter schools. They have wait lists right now to attend their schools. The superintendent was named the superintendent of the year of the Texas Association of School Boards and the Texas Association of School Administrators. You're going to short your other people. That's the only right. reason I keep saying that because we have to start at 6:30. But I, yeah, if you want to share that, I'll certainly. Let's think get outside that out. the box. Yep. Otherwise, just enjoy your Coca-Cola and go with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brandon Oje. What's that? Brandon yeah. will be followed by Nance Purcell and Gerald Brendan. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> First of all, I want to say I'm humbled by the advocacy in this room. It inspires me to do my work uh, every day. My name is Brandon Oje. I'm an English learner teacher at Lake Elmo Elementary School. My address is 8656 27th Street North in Lake Elmo. I first would like to thank the members of the board, the leadership team, as well as the superintendent Pontrelli for this transparent process. The challenge of school consolidation. Excuse me. The challenge of school consolidation is an emotionally complex consideration, and I appreciate the divergent perspectives that have been shared thus far. I think only through a consideration and thorough understanding of all stakeholders' viewpoints will we as a community come to a decision that will truly position us to continue offering all students the education they are entitled to. I've been an employee of the district for six years. To say that I feel fortunate to work in Stillwater Area Public Schools and specifically Lake Elmo truly doesn't capture the sentiment I feel towards this great district. Like all of our schools in the St. Croix Valley, I work in an unbelievable building with its very own community and identity. Diversity of all kinds is seen as assets, celebrated and incorporated into student learning. Throughout this process, I have heard numerous mentions and concerns around equity. This oftentimes is a nebulous idea with little reference to concrete experiences in our own lives. I've dedicated my career to this idea in serving families that have barriers. Barriers that perhaps prohibit them from doing just this, speaking their truth due to a language barrier in front of a school board and their community. This is why I'm here speaking to you tonight. I feel a profound obligation and a heavy responsibility to advocate for all students and families of this great district. This has been a voice that unfortunately, due to no fault of their own, has been profoundly missed in this process. We need to understand silence does not suggest indifference or lack of engagement, but perhaps in a, itself illuminates the inequity that I want to talk about. In the past, my colleagues and I have worked tirelessly to build an EL program in Stillwater that can serve EL students in a way that comprehensively meets their academic and social emotional needs. While we are close, I continue to have concerns. In recent years, English language learner enrollment has nearly doubled in our district, with most of this growth accounted for at Lake Elmo. For five years, we have become a more efficient department, flexibly adapting to the needs of numerous buildings and staffs, being a pragmatic thinker, I understand we are all operating under particular financial constraints. Schools, of course, are not insulated from such concern. Money is tight and resources for additional teachers simply haven't been available. This is what inequity currently looks like in our community. A new to country student at Lake Elmo has access to EL staff 225 minutes a week, 45 minutes a day minimum. It's worth noting that this is in fact below the recommended amount of service support for a student at this level. For my own building, this is a concern. However, being a member of a greater community and speaking for all students in the St. Croix Valley, I am not here to just be a voice for my students and families at Lake Elmo. What is a greater concern to me is that we are not able to provide in some of our other buildings across the district. The same student at Oak Park this year is receiving 90 minutes of instruction per week at Lily Lake, 60 minutes of service per week. This time is not determined by student need, but instead by travel schedule and availability of a fragmented staff. We know this is not best practice. In recent years, we have had students in every building in this district. I anticipate with great certainty that all buildings in our district will see increases in EL enrollment in, in the near future. BOLD is, in fact, a forward-thinking plan positioning the district to provide meaningful learning experiences and supports for all kids. All students are entitled to services they need to be successful. These vital services cannot continue to be determined by something as arbitrary as address. And for many of our families we serve, school choice is in fact not a choice. I stand here tonight being certain of my professional and ethical obligation to students and families I have the privilege of serving every day. 
I respect the differences in this room and feel optimistic about the direction of our district. I believe Bold would in fact move this, direction in, this district in a positive direction and begin to address some of the challenges I enumerated above. In closing, I encourage the board to reflect not only on the many voices that you have heard here tonight and in the past few weeks, but also on those we have not heard throughout this process. Reflect on perhaps why we have not heard them and the impact this decision has on their students. With much respect for all the stakeholders in this room, I wish the board well in their deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Nance Purcell. Thank you, Brandon. Thank we you. appreciate your perspective. Nance Purcell, Gerald Brendan, and Aaron Bai. Hello. Hi. I'm Nance Purcell. I live at 1017 Abbott Street in Stillwater. I'm a parent of three Stillwater Area High School graduates. I'm a property owner. I'm a former teacher in the district, and I substitute in the district. My comments tonight are informed by conversations in the community, with public officials, with colleagues in the schools. But I'm also motivated to speak tonight because of the revolving door at Central Services for the last 20 years. Continuous changes in leadership affect trust, continuity, and the vision for our district. I look to the board for its connections to the community. Board members are elected. Their children go or have gone to school here. We look to the elected board to assess needs and establish priorities. We also look to the board to manage the vicissitudes of administrators that come and go because oversight matters. We count on the board to evaluate variables and make database decisions, and sometimes there are errors. As I understand it, the last levy was predicated on incomplete information, an error. The fact of transportation was not factored in. The cost of transportation was not factored in, and that's a problem. I believe we're here tonight in part because of that error, but more importantly, we're here because bold is a flawed plan. I ask you not to compound one error by implementing another. It is rare for elected officials to comment on school board proposals. In the last few weeks, state, county, and local officials have weighed in and urged reconsideration. Many dis citizens district-wide question the efficacy of this plan, and I al also urge you to reconsider. I urge you to reconsider bold for two reasons. First, it's irresponsible to close three schools based on a decline in growth scenario for the northern tier of this district. Second, closing three schools in the northern third of the district establishes a public education desert. Akin to a food desert, the northern tier of District 834 becomes geographically underserved ele where elementary school education is hard to obtain. I will not dwell on the misinterpretation of the Met Council growth projections. The board heard from Jim Drop on January 27th, and others have weighed in about the error of assuming a decline in growth in the nor in northern tier. As you are aware, the Met Council projections of, po projects a population increase of over 50% by 2040. A public apology would go a long way in this one, but please do not compound the financial challenges of District 834 by implementing another error. My second point is related, but I make it irrespective of Met Council projections. If there are no elementary schools in almost a third of our district, long bus rides become a condition of use for elementary school students living in the Marine and Withrow communities. Some students will have to ride the bus for an hour, hour and a half, I don't know, it depends on the weather, probably. Um, that's unacceptable, and parents will vote for their fee. By conservative estimate, 63 students will draw, withdraw from District 834, and that represents a, a cost, a loss of over $558,000 in state aid. Maybe it's more. We don't know. Why is this estimate conservative? It's conservative projection because when you create a public education desert, it sends a powerful message to families in District 834. And it sends a powerful message to those outside of District 834. A suburban district that doesn't provide neighborhood schools for its children? What about mission? What about property values? What's wrong here? And so, in making it difficult to assess 
excess elementary education for almost a third of our district, you contribute to great uncertainty in this district for years to come. Please reconsider. Thank you very much. Gerald Brendan, Aaron Bai, and Robin Docterman. Hi, my name is Gerald Brendan. I live at 2642 Fairlawn Drive in Stillwater, Minnesota. I have three children in the school district, two of them in elementary, one in junior high. Neither of or none of the three go to the three Im potentially impacted schools. I'd like to give you a slightly different perspective on what most parents have talked about as far as all the facts and everything about the bold proposal. This is a story or actually something that happened to me in 2009 at a different school district where they also closed three schools. Uh, the board received a plan from the administrators 45 days prior to voting. Now they had 45 days to consider the whole entire plan strictly because they had to make choices before uh, the unions and everything else. They had certain um, guidelines that they had to abide by for restructuring the schools. The school did their own demographic study they indicated that on the southwest side of the district, it was declining or stable uh, uh, students going into the school district. While on the northeast side, they were saying, well, it's either going to be stable or increasing. But in general, they said the school district was de declining in um, enrollment. And they also said that within five years, the schools would all be considered right-sized. Uh, there was little to no teacher or community members consulted about the proposal. They had the similar talks, sessions that we have had here. And um, there was a neighboring school district that also had the same issue, but they chose a different path. Now, to me, it sounds eerily familiar what's going on here compared to there. So knowing these same things that this other school district, which is Robbinsdale School District 281, has gone through, I'm going to tell you what happened after they voted and approved three school closings. First off, they learned the demographic study was totally incorrect. They now have a huge influx of students in the very areas they said they were going to have less students and forcing certain schools to close. It resulted in vast overcrowding of many schools. At the junior high, there were 16 teachers that were forced to teach out in the hallway. They had carts with their supplies, and they were teaching outside of the hallway. At the elementary schools, some of the music uh, courses could not be conducted in the music rooms. Um, they had to teach art in a non-art class. They also had um, increases of students in the cafeterias and everything else, which led to overcrowded hallways, overcrowded cafeterias, and more disruptive behavior of the students. An elementary school named Pilgrim Lane was repurposed for long-term storage. And within three years of that long-term storage, it was considered a low-maintenance building. Within three years, they had a major mold problem that resulted in people having to wear personal protection equipment just to get into the building until the mold remediation was complete. The other thing is, is that there were a lot of parents that commented about they were going to leave the school district. I immediately went and put my house up for sale and moved here because I knew this was a great school district. <clears throat> So I know I only have one minute left, so I'll try and make this quick, but the, my major concerns are is that I fear we're going down the same path of Robbinsdale School District 281, which I think all of us know is not the best school district in the state. We are known as an excellent school district, but I don't want to go down the path of 281. I want us to be our school district. I want us to have our community involved in helping you guys resolve our budget uh, uh, estimates and resolve all the budget issues, a, a good together plan. Because the other reason I'm concerned is that if the voters who have the power of the purse feel betrayed, they're not going to vote for future levy referendums, and that will have even a further impact on the school district. So I urge you, please vote no on the bold proposal, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Aaron Bai, Robin Docterman, and Ann Mosey. Hello. 
as of now, you guys haven't heard from me at all. Um, my name is Aaron Bai. I live at 15269 Upper 61st Street in still, or actually in Oak Park Heights. I live very close to the Oak Park Elementary. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a local business owner. I'm a Stillwater graduate, a taxpayer. I serve on a city commission and much, much more. On January 7th, I attended the meeting to listen. I heard the parents of the closing schools and I felt really bad for them. I listened to the administration's presentation with the facts and felt it was really researched and sad to see them close. I felt all the parents were too emotional and short-sighted. I trusted the school system. Shortly after I attended another meeting, listening to the administration's presentation again, and their numbers had changed. I noticed those small changes, but it got me thinking. The more I watched, the more I saw numbers change. The math does not add up. Losing 50 students as stated is not a small loss. The true number is unknown. It may not necessarily result in a reduction in teachers or buses as stated by the administration. This is real life, not textbook where numbers are perfect. This is a huge loss for the community. If this passes, we will not have our children come here. We currently have them enrolled, one's preschool, one's kindergarten. And so next year that is the possibility of two students. We are one of the statistics that you'll never realize is a lost opportunity because we will not be leaving. We will never have been captured. We are not the only family who has made this choice. Comparing this to a science experiment, there needs to be a constant. With the changing of the grade configuration, addition of new schools, which automatically brings in boundary, boundary changes that could balance discrepancies in the enrollment. This is a bad time to make another major change. Where is the constant in this experiment? These are large changes that should be taken in incremental steps. The district is not in a financial crisis. A stable system is needed with the changes already happening that could be great. I disagree with the public lack of public involvement. I'm disgusted with the lack of respect given to the board by the administration. The silent majority as stated by the administration is untrue. The silent majority that I've spoken to believes it's already a done deal that their voices don't matter, won't make a difference, and feels bad for everyone who is directly impacted. Four minutes is not enough to scratch the surface, and I think I'm actually closer to three. Government moves, moves at the speed of molasses in January, and it move, when it moves any faster, something is up. No good plan has ever been developed with such a tight deadline. Three more weeks, I don't feel will make a change. Parents move to an area knowing where the schools are expected to and expect them to remain. I encourage the board to vote no. The administration has told us for five weeks no delay was possible. Three more weeks makes no difference. I still do trust the board. Voting no today will show the people who elected you that you care and are willing to work with us, the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Robin Dachterman, Ann Mosey, and Lynn Tucker-Smith. Hi there, I'm speaking in Robin's absence. My name is John North, I live at 3532 Evan Williams Stillwater. Uh, some of you know I have uh, approaching two decades of experience in public finance, also as a financial advisor to the public sector, uh, which accounts for a lot of my gray hair, as you can attest to. Uh, I'm also the father of a fourth grade daughter which accounts for a lot of my gray hair as well. Um, but I think both those experiences inform kind of my thoughts and comments I'd like to share. Um, first of all, I, I, both those experiences give me an appreciation for the many goals and choices that you need to make as uh, elected officials, and so I appreciate that. Second of all, I mentioned that my daughter is a fourth grader. She attends Withrow. Um, I say that because obviously my daughter is not directly impacted by the proposal, uh, at that point she'll be in middle school. So I, not, I speak not as a parent looking at a one-year objective, but as someone, a resident, a parent, and a taxpayer concerned about the long-term sustainability of the district. Let me step back, you've heard a lot of meaningful, impactful facts over the last month or so. Let me step back and tell one story, and that's our story. When we moved to the neighborhood, we knew that Rutherford was our neighborhood school, great school, 
Um, we were fully aware of the open classroom setting. As my daughter grew older and her personality emerged, which I love her personality, we also learned, however, that that setting probably wasn't ideal, probably wasn't a setting in which she would thrive. Um, and instead, after consulting with a lot of people who knew her, uh, many with educational backgrounds, we decided uh, very strongly that a small school traditional classroom setting was where she would thrive and learn to love learning. And I would argue and maintain that that's exactly what's happened. Um, she has thrived in that setting. She has learned to love learning, which is the most important thing I think you as a board are charged with. There are two goals in my mind that you as a board uh, have before you. One is to make sure that all the students can achieve their educational attainment, their fullest, po fullest po potential. And I would argue that having those options allow for that. Um, an open classroom setting, again, for our case, would not be ideal. And quite frankly, if that was the only option we had, we would not be in the district. And therefore, the revenues that came with my daughter would not be in the district. I would argue that my story is not just one story, but it's a story of many. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and your service to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Mosey, Lynn Tucker Smith, and Lisa DeMars. Good evening. My name's Ann Mosey. I live at 12700 120th Street by Pine Point. I'm an attorney. Uh, we moved here in 2012 for the schools. I have three kids, 14, 14, and 17. Um, we are currently, or will always be, alumni of Withrow and Oak Park. Um, and the, my 14-year-olds are twins. We started at Withrow. One didn't fit there as well. She went to Oak Park, and that's where she thrived. So I'm an advocate for the small schools, and I'm an advocate for choice. Um, very little can be accomplished in four minutes, so I sent you um, background reading, uh, and I sent you two interrelated proposals in advance of this short soundbite. As a district, we should have a unified vision. The crux of our disagreement may not be small versus large, if the numbers to engage in step one had not been undercalculated for whatever reason, we might not be talking about school closings at all. Number two, our shared vision is excellence. Um, there is no disagreement from any of the engaged, passionate thinkers or stakeholders involved here. We all love our excellent schools. In my small world, I like win, win, win solutions. Add as many wins as you can. So what would it take to retain more students and happy families to identify and fix problems, trust, communication, and find the $1.26 million shortfall that you have been dealt? I say engagement, fundraising, parent involvement, passion. These are the vehicles that transformed marine Withrow and Oak Park. I provided you with a map of the enrollment trends since 2009 specific to each elementary school. You can see what that level of commitment and work looks like. Fundraising is by its very nature a connecting of people. This community is a perfect fit for just that kind of shared work. I look forward to joining in and sharing a beer when we look back at this opportunity to make a positive difference for all of our children. You have also seen Mike's fantastic list of alternatives, which includes praising Marine and Withrow's successes specifically. We know students who participate in activities have a higher sense of connectedness, self-esteem, and fewer behavior problems. This connectedness flows from families and communities, ideally. S small organizations in general have higher participation rates across the board. Like me standing here talking to you, it is this connectedness and trust that you are losing in the bold proposal in the re recommendations to delay the vote and in giving me four minutes to talk. 
And so I leave you with my proposal. Create engagement for excellence, fundraising, accountability, and many voices. Build a smaller, equitable school in the South if needed for our youngest learners. Give them what is in our system. Trim the budget. Look at admin costs that have gone up and up and up while enrollment goes the, in the opposite direction. Build on a tradition of keeping promises, not fluffing them. Vote unanimously no to bold and choose to regain some trust. Thank you very much. Lynn Tucker Smith, Lisa DeMars, and Bill Wright. Hello, good evening. Good evening. I'm Lynn Tucker Smith. I live at 1975 Betty Jane Court in North St. Paul. And I am a mother of um, a daughter who is at Stillwater Junior, Stillwater High School, and my son is a graduate. And um, I'm originally from Marine on St. Croix. And um, thank you for allowing me to speak with you tonight. And this won't be long. Um, I'm going to share with you, and I'm addressing the board specifically, the reason why I believe that you will vote no. The following comes from your Meet the Board bios on the Stillwater Area High School website. Tom. Mm -hmm. Tom wants to continue the strong working relationship between the community and the schools. Kathy. Kathy wants to see all students achieve their highest potential. She believes that in order for our schools to be effective, there must be strong community support based on trust. Kathy is dedicated to building strong relationships, not only between our schools, but throughout the community. Shelly. Shelly looks forward to being able to share her experiences and ideas as the board considers actions that will bring this district to great excellence, greater excellence. She enjoys asking questions and seeking information, and she looks forward to representing the community, families, students, and the staff of District 834. Amy. Amy looks forward to strengthening existing and developing new relationships as parents, teachers, students, and members of the community partner to build on the tradition of academic, athletic, and artistic excellence in Stillwater area schools. And Paula. Paula is grateful for the generous, deeply invested community which surrounds and supports our schools. Paula is committed to advocating for all of our students, pledges to be a strong steward of the community's resources, and will strive to contribute to a culture where all members of our school community are valued appreciated and respected. Paula is eager to work with all stakeholders to ensure that we both preserve and continue to grow the strong, enduring <coughs> legacy of Stillwater Area Schools. Tom, Kathy, Shelley, Amy, and Paula, thank you for being true to your word and voting no to bold. DeMars, Bill Wright, and Casey Ann Posh. Welcome. Hi. My kids would love this. You're on TV, you can tape it. Oh, okay. I don't know. Do I need both? So okay. For, for, the, for the TV. For the TV? Yeah. The TV. Okay, my name is Lisa DeMars. I live at 14707 Nason Hill Road in Marine on St. Croix. I have twins in the fourth grade that will not be directly impacted by the closing of, of the schools. However, they have already been impacted by um, this whole process. And uh, I just wanted to go over something quick. Um, the proposal itself, B-O-L-D, Building Opportunities to Learn and Discover. That's confusing to me. How can a proposal that closes three schools, displaces 
hundreds of children, has the potential to financially devastate communities, and has already created a larger division in our district. Use the word build in its title. We use bold, everyone talks about bold, but what really is it? It's talking about building opportunities. And I'm sorry, but closing three schools is destroying opportunities. Um, for this reason alone, the board should unanimously vote no tonight. We have received a constant barrage of conflicting answers, misinformation, and lack of any kind of humanness from this leadership team. The board members are our only hope. I've looked back at some of the key meetings and articles regarding the school district and have found a few things I just want to remind people. In August, when Denise Pontrelli was first on board with the Stillwater District, she was quoted in the Woodbury Bulletin in regards to the bridge to excellence and the new bond. She said, it's a pretty hefty plan. Before we can look at any new initiatives, it's really about making sure we're doing really well in what we've already taken on. We would have initiative overload if we tried to bring in too many new things. That was August. And we heard in December of the new plan. In January at Central Services, George commented on the responsibility of the board members, their legal, civic, economic, and moral and ethical responsibilities. Does bold really fulfill all of these responsibilities? At a meeting last February regarding the bond, someone questioned how non-student taxpayers would feel about the 97, yes, non-student, non-parent, people with no kids, would feel about the $97.5 million price tag. Kathy replied, for the taxpayers, I think the best we can do is to maintain strong schools so your property values stay strong. What will the board say to these taxpayers in the north when property values start declining? Is the mere savings of $1.26 million in the scope of a nearly 90 million, sorry, million annual budget enough to displace these students, to create community of distrust, to divide the district, to financially devastate the communities? In January, at the school board, your CFO even voiced her opinion about how little $1 million is. When asked about prior budget cuts and ending, in a large, and ending with a large general fund reserve, her answer was, I would never, ever, ever, ever want anyone to lose a job or service because I missed. Is 1% miss significant? I don't like it because I know the impact if I'm off by $1 million. But in the scheme, is it? I don't know. What do you guys think? Is a million dollars enough for all this trouble? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Bill Wright. Bill Wright, Cass Casey Ann Posh, and James Feller. Hello, everyone. Um, Bill. Bill Wright, uh, 12388 Keller Avenue North, uh, right across the street from Withrow Elementary School. A recently built house right across the street from Withrow Elementary School. So, <clears throat> Anyway, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak again. I sent a note out to Superintendent Pontrelli and the board members earlier today. I know you receive a lot of emails. I'm not sure you've had a chance to read it. I want to briefly summarize it here tonight, but I encourage you to read it. And again, I know you, you receive a, a, a large volume of, of notes. In the note, I first encourage you not to delay the vote this evening. I, I think that, that this process, the people here, the administration, the board, we deserve to, to have some form of revol resolution from the thoughts and uh, opinions that have been shared. So I, I encourage you to actually have the vote tonight, and I further encourage you to vote no. 
and, and let me be clear that a no vote does not, it, it does not mean some things. It does not mean that we do not support some of the services and solving some of the issues that have been so well articulated. I, I could not agree more with the teacher from Lake Emma who is up here as far as students need these services. None of us are debating <laughs> that, that these are important. What we're debating is this the best way to go about it. And, and I think that needs to be clear. It also does not mean that you do not support your administration. It means that you are giving them advice in your role as board members. You know this district, you know this system, you can give them helpful advice about what you know and what will work and what will not work. So please vote no. And in the place of voting no, or as you vote no, there have been a lot of questions around what proposals would then we come forward with. Let me give you three things that I would do if I was in your position and which are in the board's power to do. I would launch three task forces. The first task force would be chartered and empowered by the board to work with the administration and this task force would be comprised of a combination of administrators, uh, school employees, teachers, community members from all across the community, civic leaders um, to, uh, for all these three task forces. The first task force would look at the um, Long Range Facilities Plan. This has been coming up a lot in discussions as far as both its, vi its further viability, what was wrong with it, what continues to still work, and its impact on the $97 million bond. I would empower this task force to, to uh, reopen that Long Range Facilities Plan and report back to the board what is still viable, what if anything needs to be changed based on what you know now versus a year later, and give you the information that you need to vote whether you still sustain that long range facilities plan and all the things that were both explicit and implicitly uh, provided in that plan or if you will vote on any modification. That long range facilities plan passed with the unanimous vote by the board with significant community involvement. It should receive that same community involvement and same board uh, um, involvement if you are to modify it or change it. That would be the first task force. The second task force uh, would be uh, set up to look at the proposal that has since been floated, uh, well, since the, uh, uh, no, that's, that's fine, one minute left, since the uh, 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 bold uh, proposal was put in place, and that's to look at the Montemedi School District um, consolidation. None of us know whether this is actually the real thing to do, but it deserves a shot and it deserves to be looked at. I think we've received some responses that some people aren't interested in looking at it. That's not good enough. You are not the district. You represent the people here who are in the district. Some of them are asking to look into this option. You need to look into this option so you have enough information to know whether this is the way to go or not. It may not be, I don't know, but please look into it. And the third task force needs to reopen the school closure um, issue, decide before you assess or before you put forward which schools to close, what are the criteria? In what instances does it make sense to close schools? Establish that cr criteria transparently with this task force that empower them if necessary, to start making those decisions based on those clear rules that have been set up firsthand. Lastly, I just want to make one point about emotion. It's been brought up a lot. Emotion is not a bad, negative thing. You're, you're receiving a lot of feedback from emotional people in emotional settings. Emotion can be the driver for some of the greatest insights that you will ever hear. And I think you need to harness the emotion and the energy that you have from this group to move forward in a positive way. And I think these three task forces are a good way to start that process. Thank you. Thanks. Casey Ann Posh, followed by James Feller and Ziss Weisberg. Welcome. Good evening. This is very weird. <laughs> All right. That thing will roll right off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Casey Ann Posh. I live at 3403 uh, Tall Pine Trail in Stillwater, Minnesota. And I'm here tonight um, to just um, ask that the board, um, I will echo other sentiments, not delay the vote tonight, and in doing so, vote no. And there are two um, top reasons. I've given you lots of reasons in the last three years as to why um, things need to um, not stay the same, but to uh, be evaluated um, by other means other than just economics. Um, first reason you should vote no this evening is that um, a vote of yes is highly disrespectful highly disrespectful to the communities of Withrow and Marine and Oak Park, particularly Marine, who has worked with this district over and over and over for the last, who knows how many years, but in my experience, 
deeply and entrenched with you for the last three. They've done everything that you asked. If in two years we have to close that school, I think that decision should be made with community input, a community task force, and it should, be not, it should not be a surprise because you are decimating a community economically. There's nothing up there once you take that school other than a general store, a bar, and houses, and who's going to move up there when there is no school? It's deeply disrespectful to this community and that community. Secondly, um, is that our children should be coming first for you guys. And I think that they do, but I think that we've gotten wrapped up in money the last three years. And I think we need to go back to what is right, and it's our children. And the gentleman from Lake Elmo, he's right. Those children need those services. And our children in Apton Lakeland, they need better than what they have. But you can't take from our children in Marine and Withrow and Oak Park to make that better for them. That is robbing Peter to pay Paul. My child does not thrive in his home school. So let me just offer my illustration. I live in Liberty on the Lake. I live 30, 333 steps from Rutherford. 333. You put in more than 333 steps walking in Target and Cub. I put in almost 333 steps walking into this building. If anybody should be going to their home school, it should be my children. I walk out my front door, and I stand on my porch, and I look to the right, and there is that beautiful school with the beautiful bridge and the beautiful lake. But guess what? It wasn't beautiful for my children. It was horrific, terrible, degrading, and utterly humiliating for them to go to that school. And not because that school isn't filled with beautiful teachers. Mrs. Bonas, Mrs. Um, Simsick, Mrs. Appert, lovely, beautiful human beings who cherished my children and loved them fully, and I will forever be grateful for that. But my child did not thrive in an open concept. The only place that my children thrived were marine. And I think it's an utter disrespect to children who are just like my children, because there are a lot of them. If you think for one second they're a small percentage, you're wrong. Your capture rate proves it. Over and over again, when I talk to my community members, closed walls are what they want. And I think you've seen that, and you're going to continue to see that if you choose to vote yes. So thank you for your time. I'm sorry it's been so emotional. No, thank and, you. And uh, good luck. Yeah, thank you. We have two speakers left, James Feller and Z Ziss Weisberg. Jim. Hi there. All right, Jim Feller, 815 Nightingale Boulevard, Stillwater, Minnesota. I think I'm the guy that uh, Didi warned you about. All right, I told you on January 7th that I thought the bold proposal was a reckless experiment with the educational futures of our children. Now, five weeks later, after reviewing the overwhelming and fully documented evidence prov proving that bold proposal is irredeemably flawed, and listening to the administration respond to this evidence with shifting rationales, non-answers, misleading answers, and at times patently false answers, I realize that reckless doesn't even begin to describe this irresponsible, grossly negligent, and hopelessly incompetent proposal. Now, there are three, ke three key tenets underpinning the bold proposal. We need to close three schools to save 1.26 million so we can reinvest these savings in new programming, which in turn will somehow achieve the nebulous and as yet undefined but noble sounding goal of equity. We need to close three schools because the demographic data shows that there will be no growth in the northern part of the district. To quote Ms. Pontrelli, the schools are in the wrong places. And finally, we need to close three schools because the district administration shockingly discovered that the district faces an issue with excess capacity. Unfortunately, even the most cursory examination of these three tenants reveals that each and every one of them is absolutely false. Multiple community members who are experts in finance, complex data analysis, and forecasting have examined the savings projections. And they all, independently of each other, reach the same conclusion. It is exceedingly unlikely that the bold proposal will result in any meaningful savings. 
They have provided overwhelming and fully documented evidence to demonstrate this to both the district and the board. And yet, the district still clings to these savings projections. Why? Because if they admit that the savings projections are highly unlikely, highly risky, the board proposal falls apart. With no savings, there's no additional programming and no achievement of whatever equity means. Turning to the demographic data, the parents and community have provided overwhelming and fully documented evidence that the district leadership has misapplied, misinterpreted, and at worst of all, misrepresented the growth projections developed by the Met Council. The evidence is clear. The district leadership's assertion that the North is not projected to grow is patently false. And yet, the district administration continues to cling to this misrepresentation. Why? Because if the district were to admit their error, the bull proposal makes no sense. Finally, parents in the community have provided overwhelming and fully documented evidence demonstrating that the enrollment projections developed by Hazel Reinhardt are highly suspect and unreliable. They have shown that the projections are based on home sales data from two of the worst years in the history of real estate sales. As a result, the projections are already wrong. In response to this evidence, Ms. Pontrelli simply stated that Ms. Reinhardt is well known and is always, quote, spot on, unquote. She challenged us to ask anyone. So we did. We asked Robbinsdale. They disagree. They, re they relied on Ms. Reinhardt's projections, closed schools, and now they are facing, as you heard earlier today, uh, with an overcapacity issue and are spending millions of taxpayer dollars to reopen schools. All of this overwhelming, fully documented, and to date unrefuted evidence demonstrates beyond doubt that the key tenets of the board proposal are absolutely false. On January 7th, I and many others implored you, the board members, to fulfill the duty for which you were elected, to act as a check on the administration rather than as a rubber stamp. Unfortunately, to date, it is, clear, it is clear that you, the board members, with the notable exception of one, have failed to do your duty. You failed to ask hard questions when the administration presented you with a proposal full of more holes than Swiss cheese. You failed to challenge the administration's erroneous and overly optimistic assumptions. You failed to question the administration's fatally flawed analysis. So tonight, as a parent, a community member, a taxpayer who voted for the levy, and ultimately, according to the district's organization hierarchy, as one of your bosses, I am here to inform you that I am no longer asking. I am telling you, do your job. End this travesty tonight. Do what you were elected to do. Put the best interests of the children above those of the administration, above your own political interests. Vote no tonight. Good evening. Good evening. That's tough to follow. My name is Ziss Weisberg. I live on uh, uh, Kimbrough Avenue in Grant. These last few weeks have been an eye opening experience. It's too easy to drop your kids off at school and not pay attention to the other families. I'm grateful my children are doing well in school, but this isn't true for every child. Some are packed in classrooms too large to learn. Some who need extra assistance don't get enough of it. This isn't fair. If we want our schools to provide excellence, we have to want that for all children, not just our own. Parents are asking, even pleading for help, and all too often there's no adequate response. Is the response more money? I think the answer is more human than that. Remember Rosie Peters from Joplin, Missouri? She spoke courageously about how the community of Marine cared for her family. Our community is a valuable asset you'll never find on the books. The response is us, parents, children, teachers, and educators. Bold is the wrong response. It pledges equity, but what does equity mean when you break promises to one child and make false promises to another? For a child thriving in a small school traditional model, equity isn't moving them to a less favorable environment. Equity isn't promising children more programming, but not hiring the additional staff to provide it. Equity isn't promising right-sized classes, but not changing staffing ratios to actually achieve this. Burdening children with less sleep, less time for after-school activities, less parental involvement because their new school is so far away, is an equity. There is no definition of equity that includes denying some children a fair opportunity for a public education because their school is located in the wrong place. It's the solution that's wrong, not the school's location. Bold is the wrong solution and the wrong way to achieve progress. Endorsing this plan is approving the manner in which it was achieved. 
Deceiving the public to support a bond with false promises is the wrong way to achieve progress. Doing so ensures you'll never pass another proposal again. If we're having an adult conversation about bold, we must speak truthfully. Enrollment at Withrow and Marine is growing. Class sizes at Withrow and Marine are on par with other schools. No school is suffering because of Withrow, Marine, and Oak Park. Leadership requires building consensus, not divisiveness. Scapegoating some schools for the problems of others isn't leadership and historically has never been a way to achieve progress. Leadership requires making evidence-based recommendations. Progress is a mirage if it's built on a rotten foundation of speculation and misinterpreted facts. We don't want our 97.5 million in tax dollars to turn into a junk bond. The superintendent has told us Bold was based on their new capacity study. That's not true. What Bold is really based on is losing. Losing growth, losing students, losing schools, and losing teachers. If you look at a map of Washington County, Bold is a plan that gives up on the upper half of the district. It places too much stock in yesterday's projections that, like the weather, are highly unpredictable. If the weather forecast is wrong, your family picnic gets rained out. If demographics are wrong, millions of tax dollars are wasted and communities are irreversibly damaged. Even Hazel Reinhardt said, if attendance area boundaries change, projections won't be accurate. Aren't we changing boundaries in the next few weeks? What is the capture rate? It is us. Growing this family is our best chance of success. One way to market, one way to market the district is to care about those students who choose to leave it. This is a human loss much more valuable than the $9,000 we hear about. What is that student capable of? This loss denies our schools the opportunity to educate a young mind and benefit from the fruits of those labors. Listening to the Director of Finance quantifying the dollar-for-dollar dollar loss of 50 students as no big deal and easily offset by staff reductions was a painful, disrespectful, dehumanizing experience. It's also a disastrous marketing strategy. It's also a disastrous marketing strategy unless you're marketing for our competition. You have to care more than that. Let's collaborate on a plan for growth like the one we voted on. Aggressively market the district, set benchmarks, and give the plan a chance to work. If it doesn't, we'll make hard choices together. Parents are pleading for you to help their children. We are pleading for you to let us help. Give our district time to grow. Please vote no. Thank you very much.